Well, hello, Shoreline. I hope you had a great week and just hope that your heart is in a place of worship and celebration of God's goodness. In the midst of all that we're facing, Jesus is on the throne and we're here to celebrate him. And last, last week we talked about the pathway of peace, that there's certain things that kind of establish a way that we can walk in peace, that, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he brings his peace to us, but we also make decisions to walk in peace. So I want you to listen again to Philippians chapter 4. Verses four through seven. It won't be on the screen, but I want you just to listen. And I want you to think about what these words are saying and what they're directing us to do and how we can live in a way that partners with God in walking the pathway of peace. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if you were with us last week, uh, this will be familiar, but if you weren't, I want to get you kind of caught up on where we were as we look at that passage. and And I want to challenge you to think about memorizing that passage printing out the copies we have on, the, on our website or forwarding the verses we have electronically to people. When you talk with somebody who's feeling stressful and anxious, let's share this passage. And if you get a chance, talk about what it means to you and, and talk about these specific things that God is teaching you as how you can walk and live in a way that brings peace to you and those around you. So what's the pathway to peace? Relentless rejoicing. Have you been rejoicing this last week? Have you been making a decision to notice the things that are good and to celebrate God's goodness in your life, even in the midst of challenges? And then public and consistent gentleness. Let your gentleness be evident to everyone. Let people notice your gentleness. Have you been taking time this last week to just go, wait a minute, how do I say that more gently? How do I get my heart in the right place? I actually found myself uh, last week uh, after the first service, I know that in the second service, and those of you that are are watching the second service know that when it began, in some of the formats, not all of them, the sound and the voices weren't lined up. And I realized that, and and, and then I was kind of thinking, oh no, this, and I I found myself wanting to be ungentle. And I said, Lord, give me the strength to be gentle. We'll get this technical thing figured out because we want the best experience possible for those at home. Continue to walk in gentleness. That leads to peace. Awareness of Jesus, the Lord is near. When we understand that he's near, that brings peace to us, and that peace overflows to others. Dethroning anxiety. The the passage is very clear here that that we're to be anxious about nothing. We can rejoice in the Lord no matter whatever we face, but we're anxious about nothing. Are you letting anxiety rule your life? Are you saying, you're not the boss of me, you're not part of my life, and telling anxiety to leave, and getting the other kinds of help you need to walk in the peace of Jesus? Praying with passion. The passage is so clear that we are to pray. As a matter of fact, I said last week, it says basically pray, 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 and pray. Four different kinds of prayer, but making prayer part of your life. And as we pray, God's peace fills us. And then tenacious thankfulness. Making a decision that we will notice the good things in life and being thankful and watching how when we express thankfulness, when we write it, when we speak it, when we live it, when we feel it in our hearts, that brings peace. With all that in mind, Listen again, and if if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, go to Philippians chapter four. We're gonna add in uh, in, uh, verse eight. We're gonna look at verses four through seven, but we're gonna look at verse eight at the end of our message today. But let's look at verses four through seven one more time. And just think about the apostle Paul in jail in a time of religious persecution that he's experiencing, political upheaval in the midst of all of that, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He writes these words for people in challenging times. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be evident to everyone, to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Prayer, 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 prayer. And then here's what happens. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Oh God, that's our prayer today. Guard our hearts. Guard our minds in you, Christ Jesus. Let us look at challenging situations. Let us face them and acknowledge them. Lord, Lord, we're not gonna bury our heads in the sand and act like they're not there. But Lord, those things don't control the universe. You do. And those things don't rule our lives. You do. And those things don't determine our disposition and our attitude. That is determined by the presence of God Almighty, by your spirit within us. So grow in us your peace today and let us walk in the power of that peace that the world may see that you are at work. Oh God, use this difficult time to lift up the name of Jesus. Let people look to you, maybe who've never looked to you before and draw them to yourself as we walk in the power of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the peace that the Apostle Paul is talking about, the peace the Bible is talking about here, is what I call a peace that makes no sense. It's a peace that makes no sense. Listen to these words. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Someone looks at you and they go, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. How can you be so calm? Why aren't you wound up? What's wrong with you? Get excited like I am. People say, what's, what's wrong with you people? Why, why are you walking in peace? There's power when people look and realize, you know what, you're not controlled by the emotion of this moment. It's real. It's of deep concern. You're taking actions in the right steps, but you're not ah, falling apart. And, and so God's word says, it, it's, it's this peace of God which transcends all understanding. It's so incomprehensible that other people won't know why you're so peaceful. And you won't know why. You'll look at yourself and you'll go, what's the deal with me? I'm okay. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned and I'm taking the right steps, but I'm watching other people and they're consumed by fear and anxiety. And I'm not. Wouldn't you love to be that kind of person who says, I'm surprised at myself. And then you say, wait a minute. No, I know Jesus. I know where this is coming from. I know what this is about. It's a peace that transcends all understanding. And so when people are asking you, aren't you worried? Don't you care? What's up with you? Why aren't you freaking out? So I'm concerned, and I'm taking the right steps, and I'm, and I'm doing the right things, but am I consumed by anxiety? And you look at somebody and you say, I am not. I'm really not. And you know, my dis, my, some of you might say, my natural disposition is to get pretty wound up. But I, I just realize who's on the throne. And, and that's the key. You know, when people ask you, and what a great moment, this is one of the, the, you know, the power of peace, one of the great ways we express the power of peace is when people ask us, why aren't you so, why aren't you wound up? Why do you seem calm and peaceful? And you get a chance to say things like this, because I know how the story ends. I know how this story ends, I know how every story ends, because the end of every story is Jesus is on the throne. At home, someone say Amen. And we got, some, we got some L team members and staff right here in the front couple of rows cheering me on as I'm preaching, right? But, 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 but say, I know who's on the throne. I know how the story ends. I know heaven is my home. Whatever happens in this life. I shared last week that when I was a kid, it was, it was killer bees and it was an oil shortage and it was overpopulation and it was, you know, duck and cover drills and all those things that could have created anxiety. And, and, and I look and I say, but you know what? As a Christian now, I look and say, whatever the new thing is, and can I tell you a, a sad, sobering reality? After this, there'll be something else. <laughs> there'll always be something. There always has been something. You know, the, the world's always ending in some way because someday this world will end. We don't know when that is. But if heaven is our home, okay, we know that. We're certain of that. And then we can say to other people, you know, I'll be honest with you, I just have a different view of the world. I have a different, you know, the markets are going up and down. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, isn't it? But what if, but what if, what if, what if, what if, and you fill in the, what if, what if, and you say, yeah, yeah, I don't, it could be that bad, it probably won't be that bad, but even if it is, my treasure's not in this earth. There's health concerns. 
It's real. What if? What if? What if? I hope that doesn't happen. But if it, did, if it does, heaven's my home and Jesus is my savior. The things that matter the most are resolved. And, and, then, and then people begin to look at you and see you're responding differently. Here's a question for you. How can you express an unyielding and unbending peace that rules your thought process? How, how do you start to think in ways that are peace-oriented and not anxiety-oriented? How do you change your thinking? Here's a, few, here's a few ideas to maybe help you in that process. First, my words should start to express confidence. What am I saying? Are you spending most of your time with you, when you talk with people talking about what's wrong? Talking about what could be. Did you hear, did you hear this thing and this thing? I mean, and, and if you spend too much time online or following news, which probably more than 15 minutes a day might be too much time, because it's a news cycle that just says the same things. You know, get caught up, know what's going on, but if you're consumed in it, uh, th then you're going to start saying things and talking about all the things you're anxious about. Check your mouth. Say, I, I, do I need to be repeating what everybody's already heard a hundred times? Or are there other words I should be speaking? Words of peace, words of hope, words of life. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Philippians 4, 4 through 7. <laughs> I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to rejoice. The, the, my, my, my gentleness will be evident to all. I know the Lord is near. I'm going I'm to come to God with prayer and petition with thanksgiving and make my requests. I know the peace of God that passes all. I mean, that we can begin speaking words of truth, speaking words of hope. Can I give you a challenge in the coming weeks? Every time before you talk, this is good in life in general, but especially right now, ask yourself, am I speaking anxiety-producing words or peace and life-giving words? Now, some of you are going to say, well, if I don't speak anxiety words, I won't talk because that's all I can think of. Then guess what? Don't talk <laughs> or talk a lot less. And then say, but are there things that are good that I can talk? And we'll talk more about verse 8 in this passage a little bit later, but, but it, we're really called to think about the things that are good and beautiful and worth thinking about. And then also, if you want to show an unyielding, unbending peace, watch your actions, what you're doing. Can I challenge you in this time? Don't make decisions too quickly. Don't make decisions too quickly. Uh, Sherry um, used to, years ago in our marriage, there was, there was a, a time where she would have certain moments of anxiety. She doesn't anymore, but she'd, she'd have moments of anxiety. And she'd say to me, Kevin, can you remind me of something? Whenever I'm starting to feel anxious, remind me of something. I said, what's that, Sherry? She says, just remind me, don't get a haircut. She says, she says, I'll regret it later, but when I'm feeling anxious, I'm like, I gotta do something. Maybe I'll get a haircut. And she's like, afterwards, she's like, I should, you know. And so I, uh, there's, a, there's a handful of times I say to Sherry, Sherry, and by the way, this week, don't get a haircut. Because <laughs> you might do something, you're, you know, there's some things that you just shouldn't do right now if you're feeling wound up. Show actions that are measured and thoughtful. You know, when we decided to cancel church for two weeks, and, and we're gonna be letting you know, Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, what's coming up, we're, we're gonna just keep it two weeks out. Two weeks out. So you'll always know what's going on. If you're, if you're not getting our emails, if you're not getting the videos with the devotions, contact the church or just call and ask the church. We'll let you know. We're gonna keep you two weeks out. You'll know what's going on. But we made our decision not by freaking out, not by panicking, but here's what actually happened. And this is how we decided to take these, to, to take these first two weeks off from services. Pastor Roy, one of our pastors, contacted the local police and said, hey, how can Shoreline Church serve our community at this time? And the first thing that the, the, the captain of the police, the chief of police said was this, it would be really good if for a couple of weeks you wouldn't meet. This was before the governor had said you couldn't meet with 250 people or more. And so we had already heard that from our local police. We called a key leader in the medical community who's part of our church and said, what do you think? And we got that input. And we talked about it, we prayed about it. We pulled together our L team and we pulled together our, 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 our pastors and our leaders and we talked and we prayed. We didn't panic, we didn't react quickly. We, we, had, we actually had a meeting with our L team live, or I think four of them were on a video screen. Jackie's over here. Jackie, you were on the video screen over there, right up there in the top right tile. And, uh, and so she's not on video now. She's actually sitting here to cheer me on as I'm preaching. But, but, you know, but so we had this meeting, and we didn't all see it exactly the same way, but we talked together, we prayed together. And, and then we had the governor's thing that said no groups of 250 or more. So we walked through it thoughtfully, prayerfully, and we made a wise decision. That's what you want to do in a time like this. Don't jump into things just sort of responding, but slow down, pray, get wise input, and then make decisions. So this peace 
that the Apostle Paul is talking about. He says, is a peace that guards your heart. We're gonna linger on verse seven because we looked at the beginning of the passage last week. So look back at verse seven again. And here's what it says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it's beyond our comprehension, will guard your hearts. So we're gonna talk about our hearts for a minute. And your minds in Christ Jesus. Our hearts and our, uh, our, hearts and our minds. And so we're gonna look at both of those. First, we're gonna think about guarding our hearts. Okay, the, the heart is, is sort of, for us, it's, it's our emotions, it's our responsiveness, it's how we feel about things. And, and the, the point here is that our heart should be guarded by Jesus Christ. We, we should be able to look at our heart and say, is my heart guided right now by anxiety? Is my heart guided by stress? Is my heart guided by the news cycle? Is my heart guided by my neighbor who's all wound up? What is it that, that's kind of guiding and guarding my heart? And it needs to be Jesus Christ. It needs to be his word and his truth. And, and this is the amazing thing. If, if your heart is under the control of Jesus, it will affect your emotional world. You know, it, it, here, here when we talk about our heart, it's sort of the seat of our emotions, of our feelings. And if Christ is dwelling in our hearts, and if we're aware of his presence, then he will guide our feelings. He will guide our emotions. Here's a question. What might happen if you could say, it is well with my heart and soul. Hey, how you doing? Hey, it's well with my heart. It's well with my soul. If you meant it. And sometimes you have to say things as you're saying them and you realize, I do, really do mean that. I don't feel it right now, but sometimes you have to declare it. What if you were to say, you know, it is well with my heart and my soul. And there's a, a great hymn of the church. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up with hymns, but when I became a pastor, so I became a pastor at a small country church, and they were still singing a lot of the great hymns of the church, and there was this one hymn called, It Is Well With My Soul. And here's kind of a key part of that. Listen to these words of this, of this hymn. It, it was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. And here's the words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Now, now you don't know, you might know of Horatio Spafford, but uh, his, his, he, he was uh, alive and raising his family in the middle 1800s, at a different time in the world. And he had faced some really hard challenges. Uh, he was a successful attorney, and an investor, a real estate investor, and he lost almost everything in the Chicago fire of 1871. He, I mean, he had been hammered financially. It was stress on his family. He lost almost everything he had in the great Chicago fire. About the same time, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. You don't talk about today about people dying of scarlet fever, but he, he loses almost everything he owns, and then his son dies of scarlet fever. In the midst of that really time of turmoil, he decides to send his wife and his four daughters uh, to, to go to England and have kind of a holiday and have a break. And, and he said, and I'm going to follow you shortly thereafter. Now, there's no planes at this time. It's all traveling on ships. And as the ship is crossing the Atlantic Ocean, it sinks. And 200 people drowned. And of those 200 people, four of them were his daughters. This is kind of a Job story. I mean, he'd lost everything he owned almost and then he lost his son, and then he lost his four daughters. And, and he gets this telegram from his wife. Saved alone, what shall I do? We can't comprehend. So he immediately gets on a ship and sails for England to be with his wife. And as the ship is crossing the area about where the other ship had gone down, the captain knew that Horatio had lost his four kids in that shipwreck. He'd heard of that. He invites him to come up on the deck and says, you know, this is about where you know, your four girls were buried. This is about where they, they were lost. And he wrote a song. And at that moment, he began to write the words to the song. It is well with my soul. And these are the words I read a moment ago. Now listen to these words and understand that this is written by a man who knew and loved Jesus, who had lost almost every material thing he had, who had lost his precious son and then had lost his four daughters and now is going across the ocean to see his wife who is grieving at a level that we could hardly comprehend. And he writes these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that was taught me to know, 
It is well, it is well with my soul. Do you hear those words a little differently? This isn't somebody sitting in a music room writing songs. This is somebody traveling to see his wife and figure out what shall we do? What, what, what's the rest of our life look like? Because all of life changes in these moments. But, but Jesus Christ, and when the sea billows roll, when the storms are there, he's saying, somehow, somehow through it all, I can still say, it is well with my soul. That happens when you know Jesus. That happens when you know your hope. That happens when you know heaven is your home. That happens when we know these things at the core of who we are. And so I want to think together, how do we guard our hearts with God's peace. I mean, we're, called, we're called to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus that God brings us as we walk the pathway of peace. But how do we walk in peace? And I want if you're a note taker, write these things down. They won't be on the screen, but just write these down or lock one or two of these in your heart and start these. Number one, open this book every day. Open the word of God every day and let the spirit of God speak to you. You open the word and you say, God, whatever you have for me today, whatever you want to teach me today, I'm ready, I'm open, I'll receive. Speak to me, God, through your word. I want to challenge you to reflect on Philippians chapter four. And if you could do it, memorize. I've said it a couple times, but I'm a broken record on things that I think are really important. And that I would challenge you to memorize Philippians four, four through seven. And if you want to put in a bonus, verse eight, and that'd be another blessing to you. But have this close at hand, you know, get, print out a copy of it or put it on your phone, have it nearby, share it with others, but get that in your heart and your mind so that you can just walk through this pathway of peace when you're feeling the, 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 the sea billows of life crashing around you. Ideas for guarding my heart with God's peace. Here's another one. Pray a lot with a lot of people. Just pray a lot. In these coming days when you're talking to somebody, whether they're a Christian or not, whether they go to church or not, when somebody is stressful, when somebody is anxious, when they're talking about how hard things are and all that the world's going through and all our country's going through and the, the economics and, and the political tensions and the, the, the you know, you know, financial things and medic, the medical stuff and, all, and, and you can just tell they're consumed with anxiety, would you dare to look at them and say, man, it is a crazy time, isn't it? Say, w would it be okay if I just took a moment and said a prayer for you and for me and for our world right now? And I will tell you, almost everyone you say that to is going to say yes. Last Sunday, our government declared it as a national day of prayer. But I think we should just make every day a national day of prayer. I think every day should be a national day of prayer. But if you're talking to somebody and they're stressed out, will you say to them, can I pray right now? And if you're with another Christian, just do this. Start praying in the middle of the conversation. But there's ah, ah, and there's ah, and there's ah, ah, ah. And just, and just, and they're, and they're sharing. And when they, can, when they pause for a breath, just say, and Lord Jesus, it is a crazy time, but we know you're on the throne. We know you love and you're good. You're a good God in the midst of all of this. God, we know that you can protect and you can provide. And just go into prayer and do that often. And, and, I, and I, love that. I love being with people who are Christians. If we're talking and there's something going on and they share a concern, a lot of times I'll just, I'll just roll into prayer. And I'm looking, we have a small group here while I'm preaching, but, uh, but Terry, you and I golf together sometimes. And then we'll be walking on the golf, in the golf course, we'll be talking, Terry will share something in life. I'll just start praying. I'll share something. He'll just start praying. We don't even say, let us pray. Let us fold our hands and bow our heads. We just keep walking and, and we start talking with Jesus. Is this right? I mean, how many times in the, in the last few years have we prayed together? I don't even know. You, just, you just, just roll into prayer wherever you are. Declare it is well with my soul. Another way you can walk in peace is just say, I want to start to say, it is well with my soul. A friend of mine, uh, Ben Patterson, he's a pastor, and uh, he was the chaplain at Westmont College for years and at Hope College. He, he says it differently. If you say, Ben, how are you doing? He doesn't say, it is well with my soul. Here's what he says. He says, I'm fundamentally sound. I love that. I'm fundamentally sound. So the first time Ben said that to me, I said, okay, so Ben, break that down for me. He says, well, the world may be crazy and things may go bad, but fundamentally in Jesus Christ, I'm okay. I'm fundamentally sound. So when someone asks you, how are you doing? Either say, it is well with my soul. Or you can say, you know, I'm fundamentally sound. And guess what? I always will be. I always will be. Because I know who's on the throne. I know who's in charge. It's a peace that guards our hearts, but also it's a peace that guards our mind. And that's the last part of this passage. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus that our thought processes should be guided by Jesus Christ. 
that we, we should say, Jesus, be Lord of my mind. Be Lord of my thinking. God, my mind races. God, my mind goes to the craziest places. Will you take charge of my mind? Yield your mind to Jesus, even as you yield your heart. Surrender your mind. Say, God, let me think your thoughts. Let me focus on what matters most to you. And let me have a, a decision-making process that is biblical, that is prayerful, that's informed by other Christians. Say, God, let me not race into things, but let me really say, God, what does your word say? What do you say? And I'm gonna talk to wise Christians. That's one of the things I'm doing right now as, as we're making decisions right now for Shoreline. I just, you know, I generally don't make decisions by myself. Anyways, I love to be in community. I, we talk with our L team and pray together. We talk with our staff and pray together. We get lots of input. We have a group called the Staff Advisory Team, which is, what, Kim, 15, 20 people. Greg's on that. Kim, some of our, those members are here. Um, and and we'll, we, well, we're thinking about doing this. Let's talk about it and pray about it for a couple of months. Boy, you come to much better conclusions by doing that. So seek wisdom, open the scriptures, pray faithfully, and make wise decisions. Here's a question. What, uh, what if you kept making wise choices even when everyone else is losing it? What if you're the one that people start coming and asking for your input because they go, man, you just seem to be making wise choices and you're not like this knee-jerk response. You're the one that doesn't have a garage filled with 15 pallets of water, 900 face masks, you know, and three tons of dog food. Now, maybe that is you, but I'm saying, but people are saying, okay, you, you have a measured response. You're, you're making good choices. Okay, I've got what I need, but I, don't, I didn't take what 50 other people need so they can't have it. You know, slow down. Make wise choices. What, what if we made wise choices? People start asking us for input, and that input's gonna be biblical. It's gonna be Christ-centered, and we become a witness to the world. One of the powers of peace is we witness to the world that needs to know God's goodness. I still remember in 2008 when the markets were going crazy, and I talked to Pastor Howie Hugo, and Howie was a pastor but also involved in financial stuff. Howie's always been kind of a business guy, pastor, pastor, business guy. And I said to Howie, you know, man, what, you know, what do we do right now? And this, you know, all this stuff's going on. He says, he, he goes, oh, he goes, oh, this will pass. Give it a couple years, and you'll be smart if you, you know, just uh, leave things like they are or, or invest now. And I'm like, no, no, that doesn't seem right. And he, said, and he was just like, yeah. You know, he says, this is, he says, the world's crazy. Just don't panic. And I needed to hear that. That was really good for me. I, don't have, I didn't have a lot saved, but I thought, should I pull everything out of the, the here, and should I put it under my mattress, and should I run around? And, he's, and, and, and Howie's just like, yeah, just, hey, hey. This happens. It's going to run its course. That was good counsel for me. How do we guard our minds? How do we guard our minds? Well, I want to encourage you to add one more verse in your challenge to memorize Philippians chapter 4. Memorize 4 through 7. You may have started that already, but also verse 8. Listen to verse 8 when it talks about how do we guard our minds. This passage tells us where to keep our minds all the time, especially in times like this. Listen to this. Finally, Brothers and sisters, and I'm going to give you the end first. At the end, it says, think about such things. That's how the passage ends. Think about these things. So he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, think about these things. Whatever is noble, think about noble things. Whatever is right, think about the right things. Whatever is pure, think about those things. Whatever is lovely, think about those things. Whatever is admirable, think about those things. Whatever is excellent, think about those things. Whatever is praiseworthy, think about such things. You say, well, if, if all I thought about was what's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, I wouldn't have time to think about anything else. Yes! <laughs> and wouldn't that be good, right? So when you find your mind wandering, submit it to the peace of Jesus and say, what is true? What is noble? What is right? And think. So make a list. And I want to challenge you to pick two of those things. I actually made two little lists here in my sermon notes. I made a list of whatever is true and whatever is praiseworthy. Those are two that struck me. And I just started making my list so I can think about these things. I want to challenge you to pick two of these and make a list of five or ten things. And then when your mind's racing, just go through those. Put it in your phone. You'll have it with you. And open it up and say, okay, I'm just, my God, I'm getting so fearful. Okay, here's, so here, here's some of my, whatever is true. Here's some of the truths I wrote down. God is on the throne. All the stuff happening doesn't change that. Here's another one. My wife loves me. That's true. Does that fix all the stuff in the world? No. But it brings me peace, right? Here's another one. God has made great flavors. There's delicious stuff. That's true. I like that. I feel peace about that. That's, that's exciting. Here's another one. I'm radically forgiven. I am ra all my sins are washed away and thrown in the deepest sea. They're gone. 
And none of this changes that. That's true. Here's another one. Shoreline is an amazing church. I have the privilege of pastoring an amazing church of amazing people. That's true, and nothing changes that. I live in an amazing country, a country of unparalleled freedom. I've been to other places in the world. I, I, I'm thankful for that. Here's one more truth. There is beauty all around me. There are beautiful things, starting with the people in this world we live in. When I'm getting stressful, think about these things, whatever is true. Those are some of my true things. You write down yours and think about this. And then whatever is praiseworthy. Here's some, I just wrote down four things real quickly. God deserves glory, so I'm going to praise him. Uh, what's praiseworthy? People who work hard in tough times. Our shoreline, I need to tell you, your shoreline staff and team is working so hard to serve you from where you are, from where we are. And that's worthy of praising. I praise God for the team we have here at Shoreline Church. The glory of creation, animal life, the sky, the sea. God praise you for all you've made. All of your faithful service and generosity as a church. I was thinking about what am I, what am I praise God for? I praise God for a congregation of people who love Jesus, who love each other, who pray, who give, who serve, who care. That's praiseworthy. And when I start thinking about those things that are true and praiseworthy as, as well as noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable, man, my whole disposition changes. And that leads to the peace of God that passes all understanding. So let me ask you a couple of questions as we close our time together. What witness and power might be unleashed if you express peace-filled gentleness? I preached about it last week, but I've been, I, I, I really have been thinking about that since I, I had that encounter with the, the United Airlines person after waiting for almost two hours for the call. That I, Instead of being ungentle and unkind, I was overly gentle, and I, th I felt like God breathed his presence into that encounter. How can we show the power of God through a spirit of gentleness? Grow that in the coming week. Here's the next question. What witness and power might be unleashed if you expressed a deep calmness of heart, guarding your heart in Christ Jesus. A calm heart is powerful anytime, but especially right now. So walk with a calm heart. And when people ask where that comes from, tell them. Say, you know, I'd be losing it. I'd be losing it if I didn't know the presence of Jesus, if I didn't know his peace and his strength. And you can know that too. This is a great time to share the goodness of Jesus. One more question. What witness and power might be unleashed if you express thoughtful reflection and decision making? If instead of panicking and knee-jerk reactions, we slowed down, we prayed, we read the scriptures, we talked with other people, and we just make wise decisions. There's power in that. The people are gonna see, boy, your, think, your thought process is really reasonable in this time. And you know, you can be deeply concerned and aware of what's going on and still operate with a sound mind. And that's what Jesus wants for us. So, here's the invitation. We're invited to walk the pathway of peace. And, and as we walk this pathway, as we rejoice in the Lord, as, as, our, as our gentleness is known by others because we're living in a gentle way, as, as, as we're thankful, as we pray, as we walk with Jesus, then the peace that passes all understanding guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We can walk that pathway every day. And the power of God will be unleashed through us into the world. Oh God, this is our prayer. That we would walk in the peace that passes understanding. That we would have such a peace that we don't even understand how, quite how it is that we walk with this kind of peace. Lord, may our hearts be guarded and our minds guarded in you, Jesus Christ, by your peace. And as we live in a different way, revealing your presence and your peace, and people ask us, what's that all about? How can you be the way you are in a time like this? Lord, may we point to you and say, we know who's on the throne. I know how the story ends. I know my final home and destination. And I know that through all of this, Jesus Christ is still loving and good and gracious, and he is Lord. Jesus, be glorified in our lives. Fill us with your peace and let it overflow in powerful ways. We pray in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. And everyone said from wherever they are, amen, amen. amen. Just a couple of words before I send you off with a word of blessing. Uh, first of all, I want to encourage you, if you want prayer right now, we've got our prayer team right now. They've actually got a whole room set up with a bunch of phones. Call in 
and you know, pray with them and share your need. Let us pray with you in this time. You know, one of the ways to walk in peace is passionate prayer. Let us pray for you and with you. Also, if you're with us for the first time, you're online, but you've never been part of Shoreline Church, I want to encourage you to go to info at Shoreline Church and some don't say, hey, I'm new. Here's my contact information. Get me on the mailing list for the Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, uh, you know, devotions and, and, and we'll just get you involved in what's happening here at Shoreline Church. And we look forward very soon to meeting you face-to-face here when we're all together. If you want to stand where you are here in the worship center, there are some staff and other will you stand with me. And if you're at home, you can stand. Like I said last week, or if you're in bed, at least kind of sit up a little bit and, uh, and maybe open your hands to receive this word of blessing. May you walk the pathway of peace, hand in hand with Jesus. May your heart and your mind be guarded by Jesus Christ. And may people look at you and say, I don't get it. How can she be so peaceful? How can he be so peaceful? And if they dare to ask you why, you point to Jesus and let them know. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine on you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week, and we will see you next Sunday.